everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition. We are going to be talking bonds today. And it's funny because if you go back, I think it was maybe a year, a year and a half ago. Might have been longer than that. Uh, we had Bill Addis on the program. We actually did some videos that were at otacademy.com where we talked about bonds. And we had this wonderful video called The Argument for Falling Rates. Oh, how the times have changed, my friends. Today we're going to be talking about the case for rising interest rates. Lo and behold, we've got none other than Mr. Bill Addis joining us today. Bill, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Merlin. Great to be back. Thank you. Appreciate good to have you with us. And good to have all the viewers out there. Hello, Tomasina, Steve, Mario, Gayer, and Jorge as well. I'm sure many others will be joining us soon. So let's start off with the, the, the big picture here. Obviously, we have... Um, Many arguments that we could still point at to say that rates are going to be dropping, and this is, I think, is the big challenge for today's discussion because we've been looking at the dollar. Dollar's just been getting weaker and weaker. We know the Fed is going to be printing more and more money. You know, they're back in all these corporate bonds and debt and everything. That would lead me to believe that the rates would would actually be falling. But you seem to think it's going to be going the other way. So this is probably a good thing for those that are talking about negative interest rates. What is your argument or case for rising interest rates at this point? And by the way, that ping pong going back and forth, higher, lower, higher, low, is what goes on my head all the time. But um, I'm, I'm really becoming much more convinced that we really are much more going into a rising interest rate environment. And you might remember last year when we were talking and the discussion was, you know, 30 percent of the world's bonds were negative yielding, government bonds. Why couldn't the U.S. bonds be negative mm -hmm. yielding? And in fact, we did have some situations, kind of little idiosyncrasies, but we did have some negative yields here in the U.S. But, but I think at this point it comes down to uh, good old supply and demand, which you know the OTA community loves. Yeah. But we have got such a predominance of, of bonds coming into the market. It, it really, you know, we have to, to have this discussion, we have to talk about the deficit. Because what's driving my discussion is we have got such an avalanche of bonds coming into the market to finance this ever burgeoning deficit mm -hmm. that just on a supply and demand basis alone rates have to go up. Meaning, you know, obviously like anything else, you have a lot more supply coming into the market that depresses prices, which in the bond world means yields go higher. So with all of the supply of bonds that are starting to come into the market to finance this deficit, we are starting to see interest rates tick up. We're starting to see the yield curve shift, which is going to be interesting. We'll talk about that. But this supply situation is only just starting. So I, th I think it's a, it's a voting for higher rates. Just that simple. Well, let me show you guys a screen over here to, to see what we're talking about. We have uh, this is the debt clock, which if you want to get really depressed, you can turn on the radio and listen to politics, or you can just look at the debt clock. And uh, actually, when we started this, I, I wrote down some numbers, just, and I'll, I'll let you know how much our debt has increased. It's already increased, by the way, $10 million dollars in the how, how many minutes we've been doing the show and been it's been four minutes we've already increased 10 million oh make it 11 million dollars on the on the session and uh you notice right here where my cursor is spinning around that's the u.s federal budget deficit right now it's 2.9 trillion that's just the federal budget deficit um that is well as increased by about 1.7 million since we started doing the show and it's getting faster and faster and faster so you know bill as this um debt continues to increase obviously they're going to be issue it seems like they're issuing more and more to cover their bases why right. why would that bode well for rates rising well again just to look at the supply side and let me finish and just elaborate on the yeah, numbers yeah. you just said because as you said the budget deficit that's the number we're really focusing on here because the people in the audience have to understand the budget deficit are bills we actually have to pay you know these are obligations we have to meet and we don't have enough money to do it so to meet that shortfall, to meet that deficit, that's why we issue bonds. So this deficit, which is right now at 2.9 trillion, and by the way, the budget year ends at the end of September, so only a month away, but everyone expects that the deficit this year will come in at about 3.7 trillion. Yeah. So that means the US government has to borrow 3.7 trillion more this year than they did last year. And this 3.7 trillion is three times the largest deficit the U.S. has ever had. You know, if you go back to the crisis in 08, we had a deficit just over a trillion, the largest we ever had. We're talking about now 3.7. That's a lot of bonds coming into the market. Now, again, a lot of people get confused um, on the whole inverse relationship and prices and yields. So let me, let me translate kind of how that results in higher yields. So if we assume the government is starting to sell more and more bonds, like they are today. I mean, today we had a record auction of 
50 billion of two year treasury notes. Every auction we're doing these days is a record auction because they keep having to increase it more and more. Mm -hmm. So if you have more and more supply of anything at an auction, you know, or just coming into the marketplace in general, if we assume demand to be a constant, if you have ever increasing supply coming into the market, that depresses prices. Now, in, in the world of bonds, when your prices are going down because of the supply, that means yields are going up. Or, or to say it another way, with the government having to sell more and more of these bonds, they're going to have to offer more and more attractive yields to appeal to investors. Right. Now, a good question came in from the audience here. Let me make sure I can get that one. Um, this is from Zach. Great question. He says, how would the government be able to afford those higher interest rates? So here they are saying, okay, you know, if you look at the 30-year, you're getting to, the, you know, getting to 2%. Well, it, it, can, can they make that obligation is the big thing. We, you know, we talked about corporations at a point where they may have to be at the inability to pay their debts. And obviously, the government will just make more money to pay its debts. But, I mean, that continues to devalue the U.S. dollar, continues to, you know, uh, make our fiat currency look weaker, weaker, which Brendan, of course, is screaming in the background in our chat right now. Um, you know, I, I get the, the yields, but his next question is great. Will they be able to afford it? Well, and, and you know, it's, it's a good news, bad news, because to be honest with you, my frustration is, is that this deficit problem is something that Congress just doesn't seem to be willing to address in any circumstance. You know, we can blame the pandemic now, but let's be honest, it's not something that Congress really wants to address. And the, the issue, though, is right now we are borrowing unprecedented amounts of money. But the good news is, at least today, is we're borrowing at an unprecedentedly low interest rates. You know, the U.S. government today can borrow money for 30 years and only have to pay 1.3 to borrow that money. Now, even with that, though, because of the amount we're borrowing, interest on our debt is the fourth largest expense the U.S. government has is just paying interest on all of our debt. And that's when interest rates are at the lowest we've ever seen. What's going to happen when these interest rates start going up again? You kind of have a, a perfect storm situation. And what that then does is that increases the amount you have to borrow, right? Because mm -hmm. we don't have the money to pay this extra interest. <laughs> so we're just going to have to borrow that too. Yeah. So it's just a cycle where we'll just have to keep borrowing more. You know, at some point, I, I, and I say this for a lot of different things, you know, you keep that cycle going it has to you know bite itself you know the snake that bites its own tail so to speak or dog it bite whatever whatever that stupid phrase yeah. is but you know it, it, to me it has to to come home to roost at some point when you, you can't just keep printing more money to pay for all the debt that you've been incurring and increasingly incurring i mean it, it, what does it take to break this system or this cycle that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Actually, sixty-four that's, trillion dollar question. There's sixty-four thousand is a rounding I mean, error, my friend. <laughs> that's right. I mean, you know, let let let's be honest because it does get into a political conversation. Because I think if you talk to any sane, rational people, everyone would agree an unsurmounting deficit is a problem. We all agree with that. The unfortunate reality is we then get stuck with the re re reality of how do we deal with it. Right. You know, I, I am literally broadcasting from Washington, D.C. today. I'm four blocks from the Capitol building. And I don't know. I'm not hearing a lot of people who are talking about the deficit as this thing we have to address, particularly in light of the fact, and this is what I wanted to stress to your viewers, the we have a new budget that has to be approved by October 1st. Yeah. Our, our fiscal year ends September 30th. Um, meaning we're going to have a government shutdown if we don't get a continuing resolution or a new budget. Now, nobody's talking about a new budget. They're very preoccupied with other things like getting themselves reelected. So as a result, we could be facing a shutdown in, se in the end of September. But more realistically, we're going to get a continuing resolution. Yeah. But that type of shenanigans also affects the value of the dollar, also affects you know, the uncertainty of the market, the value, you know, what happens to interest rates. You know, all of this is correlated and inter interrelated. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. There are a couple great questions or comments in here. One uh, from GD. She says, uh, U.S. currency will be weaker against what? Aren't all currencies devaluing right now? Yes, they are. You know, and this is the, what is it, the, the prettiest horse at the glue factory or, the, right. you know, the, one of those horrible analogies. Yeah, they're all devaluing, but there's some that are going to have a weaker economy and their currency will probably be doing worse because of it. So while we're all devaluing, they're all doing the same thing. So that keeps things somewhat normal. I know it sounds weird, but uh, right. we are seeing some nice trends. If two things are going down, they look parallel to each other. But exactly. I would point out relative to our conversation, though, as a generalization, the economies that are the currencies that are going down the most are those currencies where the central banks are engaged in quantitative easing, where they're just printing money right. to put in. You know, that's where we're getting the greatest devaluation. 
in those countries that aren't doing QE, you're not getting as much. Um, you know, great question from Brendan. He's got it on a couple different fronts. He was talking about, will, will rising rates be inflationary or deflationary? I know this is a big macroeconomic question. I know that you you study the relationships of rates and, and how that might impact inflation or deflation. What do you, what's your take on uh, the current situation? I am, it, rising rates are inflationary, but it's also kind of a question of the tail wagging the dog again, because it is the rising rates that causes inflation, and inflation causes rates to rise, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, there, there's, it's almost impossible, it is impossible to just parse out the one factor. So we can use those terms interchangeably. Um, I'm going to throw fear into you, the conversation a little bit, um, just because you are starting to hear the word and just to explain it. You know, one of the one of the fears that people have is all this money that the Fed has thrown in by just continuing to print. Um, ultimately, money people feel should start having inflationary impact. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the economy is necessarily going to be strong. And what's starting to scare people is the prospect of something called stagflation. Mm hmm which is high inflation with a stagnant economy. And those normally do not go together. They did in the late 70s, early 80s. But that's what people are starting to worry about. Well, you know, you talk about the 80s. I mean, we had 16% inflation. Uh, oh, no, it was, we were getting 16% 30 year fixed mortgages. I just right. refinanced at 2.78. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure I couldn't afford a 16% mortgage right now. Really? Brought yeah, to you right. by Visa and MasterCard, by the way. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> No, the good old days of interest rates. So with this deficit, and I just got to keep pounding this drum, though, because realize we uh, keep harping about this $3.7 trillion deficit. All of the auctions we're doing now of long-term treasuries are now been record auctions for the last month. Mm -hmm. And that will continue to be the case, meaning they just keep increasing the size every month to try and support this deficit. So the supply has already started. And the truth is, last week on the 10-year treasury, and the 10-year is kind of the benchmark we use a lot. They came to market with a record auction of 10-year treasuries, and the demand was not that great. Mm. And, and we did see the 10-year yield go up by about seven basis points on general last week. So I think we're starting to see this shift. I really do. Um, let's talk about the yield curve for a little bit, because this is something that you and I discussed in the past. I know many others uh, may have seen that video we did on the yield curve. Obviously, we had that inverted yield curve back in August. Um, that was one of those things got a lot of people freaking out. They might have an inverted, or the inverted yield curve could lead to another recession. Um, of course, some would argue that the COVID was it. You know, we've already we've already moved past that. Um, we're at a point right now where the yield curve actually looks pretty normal, right? You got the short-term interest rates are obviously very low. Uh, we'll call it zero, and your 30-year is is bumping up to. I don't know if it actually gives me the numbers if I mouse over this. No, it doesn't. Uh, you guys can see on the left-hand side. Of your, what's that? 1.35. 1.35. You guys can see the left-hand side. You have this nice upward sloping trajectory. So, you know, we talk about the rising rate environment potential here. It seems to me like it doesn't really need to, to happen anyway. Like, you know, we, there's no, at this point, looking at this chart, doesn't really feel like we're going to have that inverted yield curve. Let me show the viewers what it looked like back a couple of years. Um, here is... Back in 2015, we were kind of the same spot we were at. Oh, let me see if I can. Did scroll you have a, like a March or sep uh, September or August of 19? Yeah, I, I can get you anything you want, brother. You just let me know. All right, so August of 19, I am on it right. And there we go. So there, there you guys see the inverted yield curve. You had that yeah. short term. You know, the the three month was much higher than the two, much higher than the five, uh, and and getting really pretty much even with the ten. That's where we get that inverted yield curve. Yep. And, and what we're proposing now, or what I'm proposing here now, Merlin, is at the short end of that yield curve, looking at today's, you know, the Fed is holding that interest rate. You know, the Fed controls the short end of the market. So think of it like, you know, they're holding the end of the lever. You know, they're keeping one day interest rates at zero, the Fed funds rate. Right. And the short end of the market is going to respond to that. Literally, they're holding that end of the string. Right. But what I'm proposing is with this onslaught of supply that's coming in, and Mnuchin, Secretary Mnuchin has already told us they're going to do it mostly with long-term financing. Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be locking in these rates for as long as they can for just the reasons we were talking about. So they're going to hit the market with a boatload of long-dated bonds, and again, all of that supply should shift the yield curve up because I, I agree with your observation that the yield curve is normal today. You know, It's got an upward slope, but look at that scale. You know, the, the short rates are at zero. The long-term rates are at, what, 1.35. Yep. Now, there's not a lot of slope there. There's not a lot of velocity to that slope. What, I, what I'm proposing is that velocity, that steepness is going to get a lot more steep. Mm -hmm. 
Um, all right. Well, we've got uh, obviously the impacts of major unloading of bonds, and, and you mentioned something interesting that I think maybe we could talk about. You, you mentioned that the ten-year had record, and, and there's a need for it to be a record because we are obviously have much more of a deficit. So they're going to be make, selling more to cover that deficit. Right. But what happens? There's two questions. One is what happens when we get a low showing and people just just aren't buying it, right? I mean, how do you? Right. Did, is this the drug dealer getting high off his own supply? Like the Treasury comes in and the Fed comes in and says, okay, we'll, we'll buy your stuff. And we go back to quantitative easing. And, right. and the other part of it is, you know, what do you do? It came in earlier. Let me make sure I get the gentleman's name. Um, this is from Brennan as well. It was, what will happen when China and others dump U.S. T-bills? Well, I, I, let, let's do the first one because I want to get that one out of the way yeah. first. I, I often get the question in classes and, and training. You know, China and Japan own all these treasuries. You know, they, they, people are worried that there's some Machiavellian conspiracy that China and Japan are going to dump those treasuries. Um, first off, let, let's put their holdings into some context. China and Japan together own about $2 trillion worth of treasuries. Um, the Federal Reserve owns $4 trillion. I mean, you put China <laughs> and Japan together, our, our Fed owns twice as much as they do. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, what would be the logic of China and of let's look at China just right now because they're big in the tariff news. What would be the logic of doing this? You know, because if China were to take a trillion dollars worth of treasuries and dump them into the market, I will admit the impact would be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, interest rates would go higher overnight. The value of the dollar would plummet. But China would also be hurting their largest trade partner. Yeah. You know what's that's that's hat committing Harry Carey. That's suicide. I mean, from an economics point of view, there's absolutely no, the only reason China has so much treasuries is because China has so much dollars. Right. You know, as a result of the business they do with the U.S., they just happen to own a lot of dollars. So they're not making a speculation. They're just saying, gee, we have all these dollars. Let's get it invested in something safe, just like every other major government does. It's just they happen to do it with obviously much larger size, but but not a size that should be worrying to anybody. Yeah, and I'll tell you that if it did go that route, I mean, if you if you imagine them unloading a trillion dollars worth of, of T bills or just treasuries, um, I'm pretty sure that our acting president would not take too kindly to that. And I mean, that could like be an act of uh, war in this day and age. Yeah. I mean, it would really it's completely disrupt our economy. Yeah, no, that is an act of economic war uh, under any president. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um. All right, let's see. Mario says, increasing case for holding physical gold. I could not agree more. I think that that is a great argument for it. Yep, I, I agree. And, and, you know, when we're talking about what's going up, let's be honest, with all the other currencies kind of weakening as a result of quantitative easing, you know, it's not any surprise to a lot of people. While gold is acting as a fiat currency, a lot of people, you know, would say Bitcoin is doing the same thing right now. Yeah, you know, they're absolutely. basically become fiat currencies. You know, I know this isn't your area of expertise, but just maybe I know you you're surrounded by it on a regular basis, and that is that cryptocurrency space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously there's talk about the Fed coin, which I, I saw come through in chat here a little bit ago. I right. do think in the next few years, not even you know, ten years on the road, I think it's going to be the next maybe couple of years we will be on a Fed coin. I don't know if anybody else is experiencing this, but I would say 75% of the stores that I go to now say, coin's not accepted because of a coin shortage. It's like, right. oh, that's a bunch of bullshit. I'm sorry, it's not a coin shortage. They're trying to remove the physical currency, make it go all digital. So um, what's your take on maybe the Fed coin and also you know, something like Bitcoin? I mean, I'm an advocate, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin and maybe digital currencies altogether, but you're, no offense, you're a bit of an old school guy, you know, or do you look at him and kind of poo-poo on these things like, oh, no, yeah. no, don't do it. No, no, I am, um, and I have to make a distinction here. I, I'm a huge fan of cryptocurrency. I, I think the concept is now with us, and you can't put toothpaste back in the tube. And knowing that the Fed is looking at FedCoin, there's also been very public that Goldman Sachs and Citibank and JP Morgan are working on their own cryptocurrencies. Yeah as a way of settling securities in the financial market. So cryptocurrency is here. Um, the only time, the only reason that I always sound like a naysayer on Bitcoin, quite frankly, is because I am old school and I need a valuation model. Mm -hmm. I, I want to buy things that are cheap and sell them that are expensive. I'm not necessarily just a flow or momentum trader. And, and you can't do a valuation with Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, as, a, as my type of the way I like to trade, I can't use it yet. But I was very gratified, and I was actually going to ask you off camera, but maybe this is good for the group. I heard that recently one of the major corporations, as part of their retained earnings, just cash management, 
has put Bitcoin into the portfolio. Are you seeing that as a trend? See, that's what I want to see. I want to see Bitcoin actually being used. Yeah. Not just quoted. <laughs> well, well, let me let me uh, let me show you over here. I'm going to go full screen right now and show you one of the hottest stocks that I can honestly I have ever seen. Over, overstock, right? Ridiculous. Yes. Oh, yeah. Overstock, um, it's really interesting. Like, look, I'm not going to buy any of this crap on here, but maybe, I, okay, I'll just go buy a select furniture, say 15, ooh, look at this. I'll buy an $863 couch. If I go here and I go down to add to cart, um, and then I just I'll select an option. Let's go with black. Yes, it, it's, it's my mood. 863 bucks. You go to view cart. When I go to check out, you know, if you got PayPal, but what's very interesting is how seamless they make it. Um, right down here, you got Bitcoin. You can just sure. click on it, and not only is it Bitcoin, but you can actually select, I believe, once you click Bitcoin, oh no, there's only BTC. Uh, it used to have four or five other ones. So, really? you know, these guys, and I think this is part of the reason that their earnings have been so stellar is because Bitcoin's had a huge move from 3,000 up to, you know, now 11 and change. Um, you know, they it's not like they're getting billions of dollars from Bitcoin sales, but they are, you know, facilitating that, and I think you'll start seeing more of it. So, um, I'm going to do a very interesting thing. I have not built it yet. It's going to be Thursday. I, I basically, guys, I will stay up the wee hours of the morning to to build this presentation because I couldn't find my old one. Um, but my argument is that Bitcoin will be a hundred thousand dollars per coin by 2023. So by the end of 2022 we'll see it at least 100,000. And it's basically simple math. I think you'd actually find this very interesting, Bill, because it's the, here. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of what fiat currency is. Fiat currency is like, who cares? We're just going to print more. And we're not even really printing. I'm just going to make a digital ledger entry and change everything because I can. And uh, let's be honest. I don't know if there's, uh, to me, if I worked the Fed, I'd be just adding a couple of zeros to my paycheck every month and, you know, giving some nice bonuses. I don't know what the heck's going on. But when you look at Bitcoin, you cannot do that. So you have this this mechanism that's really designed to go up, and it's not it's not going to be influenced by dilution or continuing minting of, of Bitcoin. I mean, there is inflationary there, but I'll explain that on Thursday's show. That's what makes it so compelling for me is it's it's that fixed number, and some of the other cryptocurrencies are doing that. <clears throat> the sad thing is when we look at what the Fed coin will do, it's basically just going to be fiat currency but digital. Right. right, they will have, they will c control all of the, the the keys. It won't be an open source code. It'll all be, you know, private blockchain. And they will go, oh, we need a hundred trillion dollars. Boom, hit a button. There it is, hundred trillion dollars, and we all get our currency devalued yet again. So don't get so excited about Fedcoin, guys. It's going to be. Um, it's an institutional terrible. application. It, you know, right. really. It's, I mean, I, I'm a fan of of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm a fan because, you know, you have instant transactions. I can hit a button. It's done, paid. I can pay anyone around the world. Of course, you know, those of you who are very Orwellian and looking at uh, Big Brother's watching, they already are, right, with credit cards. But now the Fed will have control of all that stuff. Um, Bill, tell me a little bit about your – I know you had a signature series going on. You were, uh, you had a yeah. – not a signature. It's called a showcase. And people have asked many times about how they can, you know, participate in your classes. I know you're doing classes not just for Online Trading Academy. I think you're also doing some for Amherst or something. Am I correct? Um, well, Amherst is the name of my firm. No, I, my whole summer has been busy with Goldman City, HSBC, and Morgan Stanley. Okay. Uh, training the institutional world. So that that's how I train, how I spend my summer because Wall Street hires this army of young people right out of college. So I help with their assimilation. But what what I'm really pleased. Um, this is my first opportunity in all of my years. And I'm a 40 year old. I've been in the bond market for 40 years. <laughs> um, yeah, no, right. Um, this is my first opportunity, really working with the retail investor, the retail consumer. So what we put together was uh, called this part of the signature series, which is a three day series. Um, specifically dedicating to its bonds, interest rates, the Fed, how interest rates correlate to other asset categories. So we've got a real full three days. And then as a preview for that, um, on this Thursday, we've got what's called the showcase, where we offer a two hour open to anybody, um, come in and watch for two hours, hear Bill's spiel about bonds, interest rates, and it's kind of a precursor to what we do in the larger class. So that's called the showcase. Um, on OTA, is, and um, that's going to be Thursday. Is that is that an online venue? You can do it online. Yes, that's that's the beauty. All of this is online. Now. Yeah, we're all in a virtual world, and you know there's pluses and minuses to it. But what I am discovering about the virtual world is, you know, you, you can hit the whole world at once. Yeah, you know, by doing one program, you can hit every time zone in the in, in the world. So there's a certain efficiency to Zoom. I, I miss the classroom personally. 
I do too. I, I, you know, you can't really tell when someone's snoring, but uh... yeah, right, <laughs> or that eye contact is good. But I mean, we're living in a virtual world now, so I think the fact that we've got this three-day series, I'm looking forward to uh, taking my experience and going out to the retail investor. I, for one, will be in there. In our conversations we've had over the past few years, I learned a tremendous amount from you just uh, about the Fed and bonds and interest rates. It's it's interesting getting someone with your kind of experience. So, uh, guys, if you want to learn more, you can actually go to tradingacademy.com or contact your local center. I actually have the page up here. There's no direct link to subscribe to or get into that showcase. You'd have to contact the center there. But if you uh, go to tradingacademy.com, which I know most of you are on the Trading Academy graduates, um, just talk to your, your counselors. They'll help you out. If you want, you can click on locations here and it'll tell you which center is closest to you. There's tons and tons of centers around the world. But it will be online and they'll have to register you that way. So um, interesting. I saw a funny meme the other day, Bill. And it said... Okay. Who's done more to transform your work's IT department? The the chief technical officer, the CEO, or COVID? Oh, God, without a question, COVID. Oh, God. I mean, COVID has certainly forced almost every company to go, okay, we need a work from home project. Awesome. Um, from 250 nights a year to this is my existence now, doing this for eight hours a day in this environment. So yeah, very, yeah, you can do it from wherever you want. Um, yep. Let's see. Uh, also, yeah, you guys, Big Eb says, Bill, sure, appreciate your LinkedIn post as well. I would encourage you guys to definitely check out Bill's LinkedIn page. He's got a ton of information there. I think I actually have it up here. I'll share that full screen for you guys so you can check that out. There is Bill Edis, AFT owner, Perfect. principal, Washington, D.C. Adam is a friend. He always is, He's got a ton of, um, ooh, what would I say your top skill is? I have to rate you right now? Ooh, boy, I tell you. Um, there's lots of articles. You can see this right here at our activity. He's got a ton of new articles put out, and I, I definitely think it's some great stuff. What else would you think is noteworthy out there in this bond market right now? We talked about interest rates going up, which I think is, is critical. We talked about the yield yep. curve, which will probably maintain its slope and trajectory. We talked about the deficit, which has gone up by since we started the show. Federal <laughs> deficit. Uh, let me go to where did that go? Where is a uh, debt clock? We've already gained. Holy cow! Really? We made 80, 80, $80 million worth of national debt has incurred since we started this show. So um, what, what else do you find noteworthy in this market right now? And noteworthy, and I have to say cautionary. I don't mean to end on a negative, but there is an aspect of the market that I don't think is getting a lot of press, and that's the municipal market. Mm -hmm. You know, the um, the state de the state deficits are just getting horrible. You know, we talked about the federal. I'm going to carry that same argument to the states. You know, they're not having as much income revenue. They're not having as much sales tax revenue. You know, the states live on tax revenue, and it's yeah. down. And yet, by the same token, their infrastructure costs, you know, pandemic-related, are just exploding. So we're going to have a problem in the muni market. You know, major downgrades, we're already starting to see it. And the Fed, you might remember, when we went through that whole litany of programs that the Fed did, yeah. did in the stimulus package, remember we talked about, for the first time ever, they were going to be providing support to the muni market. Well, they haven't started that program yet. I think they're intentionally holding back to see how bad. I think the Fed was actually very prophetic. Mm -hmm. I know we like to pick on the Fed, and I do, but I think their attention to the junk bond market, which we've talked about, and their attention to the muni market was them telegraphing to us well in advance where they thought the problems were going to come. Now, yeah. we saw the junk bond problems already. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the high yield are yet to happen, and uh, probably the munis are yet to happen. But that's why the Fed has got $500 billion sitting on the sidelines to try and support that market if they need to. Are we still seeing, because last time we talked about this, which I think was a couple of months ago, there was a shift in downgrading the ratings. And we saw a lot of AAAs being dropped to AA's, and a lot of AA's being dropped to single, and then actually shifting down into tr less than triple B. so now you're looking at junk. Is it still a, a big shift, or is that shift slowed down? I, I haven't looked well, at that. Great question. The, the rate of deterioration, I mean, we still have deterioration, obviously, we're in a recession, but the rate of deterioration has, has reduced dramatically. I mean, when in the first three months of this, uh, pardon me, slow down, Bill, in the first five months, because we was, yeah, through May, we had more downgrades into junk in that five months than we had the entire year before. Wow. And we are nowhere sustaining that because we had some real big ones. And um, so, yes, the pace has gotten better, but it is still more than last year. Crazy. Yeah, I, I remember it was such a, a compelling uh, chart that she had up there showing all it was just kind of just cascading down. And, yeah. you know, uh, it was, it was. Triple B rated bonds all waiting to just drop into junk. And, and we certainly saw, you know, 59 of them in three months, but the pace has slowed up, fortunately. All right. Um, guy Raj asking Bill's Twitter handle. He's really more of a LinkedIn guy, so you can go check him out on LinkedIn. 
We got to get you all up there on social media, man. I know. I'm old school. No Twitter, no Instagram. I'm uh, I'm old school. But I, I And even on LinkedIn, I just publish other articles that I think are a good read. I'm not pu- putting any of my own writing up there. Why not, man? You, you got some great information. There's only so many hours in a day. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> It's, yeah, uh, I know. it's prioritization. <laughs> um, we did a show a while back on tips. Um, yeah. And, and I think that that was an interesting argument. Back If you go back three years, guys, I think that's when we did it, two or three years ago, the video we did on tips, we were talking about the benefit of the securities and how what a great concept they would be in a rising rate environment. Obviously, the markets at that point were, were tanking and it wasn't a good option. If right. you look at it now, just Joseph says, does Bill buy tips? I think maybe the, the better argument is, when is the right time? And since you talk about rates going up, does that bode well for maybe moving towards tips? I, I think the market will tell us when that time comes, because I, I do like tips, just to explain. You know, I like a floating rate product um, in a rising interest rate environment. But, but on the tips right now, I'd be cautionary, because the, the yield on the tips right now is actually negative because there's such a lag effect. Mm-hmm. In other words, when they, when they reset the coupon, on the, or they reset the par value on the tips, they look back over the last six months. So you get six months of inflation and then that affects the reset of the principal. So we'll kind of get a warning as, as the CPI rate, because they benchmark this to CPI. So as the CPI rate starts ticking up over the next couple of months, mm-hmm. then that's gonna be your indication to get into tips because you'll have resets that will reflect the six month period, is that making sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like a lag effect here is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So let's see what happens to inflation. Now last month's inflation number was high. So it, you know, if you just go by that, maybe it is time. But I don't like to go just on one number. Was that an aberration? But yeah, if inflation does start becoming the issue that I'm starting to think it could be, you do want to be in tips. Absolutely. It just might be a little premature. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm trying to bring up, I'm trying to find the US, um, you were talking about CPI, correct? Yes, Consumer Price Index. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I will bring up a chart here. I'm, I'm at ForexFactory.com, guys, which is a great resource, and I'll bring up a chart. Uh, the most recent number came in line with the previous month-over-month reading, but just to show you what's happened, and, and of course this might have a lot to do with the amount of money being pumped into the markets, but here you can see CPI going back into 2013. Uh, right now you're looking at 0. 0.6 was the number we came out at, which is really the high for pretty much the past seven, eight years, maybe even more. So I right. just wanted to throw that one out there. Uh, let's, is that number an aberration or you right. know, to start something? Yep. Uh, all right, last question. This is from Big Eb. He says, Bill, is shorting any of the bond market a good idea? Um, obviously, if we think that the rates will be going up, that most likely means that the price of those bonds are going to be dropping. Um, good idea or not? Yeah, um, you know, for the active traders, you know, I like something like the ETF, the TLT. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that benchmarks against a 20-year bond. So you've got a lot of volatility there. You've got some good duration. And the 20-year sector is where I think rates are going to be going higher. So again, you're, he's that is absolutely right. With the prospect of higher rates, that means prices are going down. So absolutely, going short something like the TLT. Or as you know, there's options against that. And the other asset category, which a lot of people play the yield curve in, is the futures markets. Mm-hmm. Because you can do what's called the steepener trades where you you know go one long one futures contract short the other and just trade the relationship between them mm-hmm. so whether it's ETFs um, whether it's options or whether it's the futures yeah there's lots of ways to short the market well it's interesting because you look at all the different variables you know you talk about the the record auctions and low attendance at those I mean that gives you clues guys as to where the price of some of these securities may be headed so um, Topic du jour was a rising rate environment. I, I, I have to take your advice on that one. I mean, I, I'll, I'll gladly be watching it. My gut keeps telling me that we're going to go negative on this just because we can. And why not Why not punish savers? But, <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> right? Let's well, and I, and I will put a caveat, actually. Thank you. And I will put a caveat. If the, you know, if the equity markets are as overvalued as some people think and we start getting a major equity correction, we could see short rates go negative here in the U.S., you know, because there's going to be such a flight to safety yeah. that we could get. So, you know, that flight to safety aspect, though, is not going to be as experienced by the long-term rates. Because when people go to flight to safety, they go to short-term treasuries. Mm-hmm. So if we go negative, it would be in the short end of the market. And it's conceivable if there's a major equity correction. Uh, Venkti says, are mortgage rates going to or going up? Right now, they're not. Well, actually, in the last week, they have been. But if we do see uh, interest rates rise, then you know that's going to impact the ten. It'll impact the thirty, and and that could in turn lead to rising mortgage rates. 
Well, an, an important consideration on that is when bankers price 30-year mortgages, they price it to the 10-year treasury. Right. The reasons we're not going to get into a duration and volatility, but a 30-year mortgage looks, smells, and acts like the 10-year treasury. So if you want to follow where mortgage rates are going, follow the 10-year treasury. So we hit record low mortgages three weeks ago We because the 10-year treasury went to a record low. Now, since that time, this last week, 10-year treasuries I mentioned have ticked up about seven basis points. So have mortgages. Mm -hmm. So if you want to follow mortgages, keep a real hard eye on the 10-year treasury. That's their benchmark. The viewers want to know, Bill, have you ever met the, like the, 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 treasury, the Fed secretaries, the treasury secretaries? Um, I, I, a number of them, and I, I guess I should say in the interest of full disclosure, the Fed is actually a client of mine. I conducted a class there on Friday. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that I, I get to go into the belly of the beast. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I do actually do training at the Fed. And I will say just on a personal note, because I did meet him, the banker I have the most respect for ever is Paul Volcker. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, in the history of Wall Street, I think he's been our best banker. You know, from the, the class that you and I did, it was interesting. We talked about transparency of the Fed over the years. I, I do as well. He did what needed to be done, right. uh, and he didn't telegraph everything. It created a little bit of volatility in the market, but he was also faced with some pretty extreme times. You know, right now, uh, I think it's interesting how it's so clear cut and transparent yep. can be. I don't almost wanted to have some secrecy to it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, back in back in Volcker's days, you know, the Fed was raising interest rates two and three hundred basis points at a time. Yeah, crazy. They didn't want to tell the market what they were doing at the time, so they kind of had to hide it. We had to go back and look and say, "Oh yeah, look what they did." Right, right. Yeah. No, the transparent lack of transparency was necessary at the time, but we couldn't get away with it now. No, come on. I think we can. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right, Bill. This would love it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, you tell you what, it's been a while since we had you on. Uh, we had no internet connection issues today. I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, woo! New laptop, everything. Um, thank you so much for coming on and sharing some insights into our markets. I do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, happy. Sure. Have a have a great rest of your trading week. I know you're doing some more classes. I know you're going to have your showcase class uh, tomorrow. Uh, is it tomorrow? Thursday. Th Thursday. Thursday. And that's open enrollment. Anybody uh, welcome aboard? It's going to be about an hour and a half to two hours. Awesome. All right, we will we'll share that link here in a little bit. Thank you so much. Bill, take care. Thanks, All right, bye. My best to everyone. Okay. Be healthy. Guys, that was Bill Addis, longtime bond trading veteran, just an absolutely great guy. It, I think it's kind of ironic that you know he's on here talking about the Fed, and some of the things he says, you know, you're like, yeah, he's questioning some of the Fed moves, but he's actually out there teaching at the Fed, which is, just makes you scratch your head and wonder. Um, but he's also teaching for big banks, big institutions, so it's nice to see someone who is looking at things from the, the institution perspective and the rising rate environment. You know, it, it could very well happen, especially look at the rate at which these guys are issuing bonds. You know, they need money. They need to raise capital to pay for all this debt that they're incurring. I was, I was, you know, did it as a joke to start the show by bringing up the debt clock over here. But if you look at what's going on with that debt clock, it's crazy what's happening with it right now. I mean, we were at, if you look at the national debt, right? Right now, as of this second, 26 trillion 800 and or sorry 26 trillion 682 billion 369 million 800 thousand and change when I started it was 266 million so we basically increased a hundred and four million dollars in 39 minutes I mean that's how quick debts accumulating I mean I have friends with credit cards running 29 percent that you know they're not even accumulating debt that fast it's 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 remarkable how quickly that's running up and of course um, you know that will probably continue to do that he does look like Lewis Black by the way <laughs> so you know I was wondering Ren I was like God, he always reminds me of someone and you're absolutely right he does look like a lot of Warren uh, like Lewis Black all right uh, guys Bill will be doing a session called what's he call him uh, I had it written down over here I'm writing down all kinds of oh it's called the showcase for those of you who are interested he's doing a free one that's open to anybody who would like to attend it that'll be on Thursday to talk about his showcase series of course it'll be like a two he's about a two hour thing for free um, and then that'll tell you more about the upcoming class but you get a lot of information out of that you can find more information by going to tradingacademy.com uh, contact the center closest to you and they'll get you registered for that one it'll be all online as well um, GD says do we believe that debt clock I'm not going to sound like a cynic or a skeptic, but I tell you what, what is it in life that you actually believe right now? I don't know. Do we believe COVID? Do we believe what's going on in the Democrats, and Republicans, and QAnon? Do we believe all the crazy stuff going on? I, I don't know. You know, it's, I, I look at that debt clock and I'm pretty sure it's it's somewhat accurate. Who knows if it's spot on accurate, but it, to me, it doesn't really matter how, if it's to the, the penny, it's ballpark figures and $26 trillion worth of debt is ridiculous absolutely ridiculous um anyway 
I could go on and on and on on that, but I won't. Let's go to uh, what we got cooking for tomorrow's session. Actually, excuse me, this is for today. So we talked about the Richmond Manufacturing Index number. I actually thought we'd be come out between zero and five or one and five. It actually came out at 18. So out of the three that are reported so far, it actually looks great for the Richmond area. Empire State was worse than expected. Philly was worse than expected. And Richmond, doing better than expected. Still only at 18. Yeah, do we believe the all-time highs? I can because it ripped my portfolio apart, Joseph. <laughs> um, consumer confidence, actually a bit lower than expected. But honestly, I don't even look at consumer confidence. I think it's a joke. Um, the one that is noteworthy here, there's two numbers that came in for the U.S. That's a case shiller Composite 20 Home Price Index year-over-year -year growth dropping just slightly, no big deal. Uh, HPI numbers are um, way more than expected, which is good. And then down the bottom was the one that I talked about in the Monday morning must-knows for Online Trading Academy, which was new home sales. That's a huge jump. I mean, we went from 791. They expected actually to drop a little bit. And it popped up big time. I mean, you're looking at 901,000, so almost a million new homes sold. That is a sign of roaring optimism, especially when we look back. Last time we saw something like 900,000 was probably 14 years ago. We're now on a really nice uptrend. So uh, that's a really positive number there. Earnings-wise for today, it was blowouts. Look at everything here beat earnings. Every company on the screen beat earnings. CRM, Best Buy, Medtronic, Bank of Montreal, Hewlett Packard, Urban Outfitters, Intuit, Autodesk. Urban Outfitters? They're not even open, and they made they reported thirty five bucks worth of profit, uh, or thirty five cents worth of profit. Crazy. So anyway, that was what happened today. Here's what's cooking for tomorrow. You've got network appliances. That's one of the major names. You you have uh, Nordstrom's on here, which I think is going to get absolutely butchered tomorrow. We'll see if it drops below two billion or two million dollar market cap. I'm oh, sorry, two billion dollar market cap. Uh, Dick's Sporting Goods and Tiffany's as well reporting earnings. It's the end of earnings season. And here's what's cooking for tomorrow with regards to the major macroeconomic announcements. Uh, noteworthy here will be durable goods for the U.S. as well as crude oil inventories. Other than that, you've got Swiss franc with GDP, and I don't see too much other that's uh, you know, that noteworthy for tomorrow's session. Do we believe these earnings? GD, now you're getting really skeptical. Do we believe anything, right? Do we believe, do we believe Merlin's doing the show? <laughs> Am I real right now or I'm a virtual puppet doing the show right now? <laughs> All right, guys, that will do it for me for today. Um, we had to switch things around. Uh, uh, Justin Krebs was actually supposed to be on today, but for some reason he made a marketing flyer that said, hey, I'm going to be on a Wednesday. I said, great, no problem. I don't know if you guys have saw it. If you look at Justin's Twitter handle, apparently it's going to be a knockdown, drag him out kind of fight tomorrow on annuities. So uh, Justin's a friend of mine. We won't go down that path. So, But it will be kind of fun. We're going to have a, a pros and cons of annuities. We've got kind of the major point tomorrow because a lot of – um, a lot of um, people really looking at annuities as a horrible product, horrible product. And there's others that say, no, they're actually, they can be bad, but there's also some really good ones out there. Yes, I'm, the, I'm a hologram out there. Was Nordstrom's today? I didn't, I don't think it was. Let me, you know what, just because it's there, it should be aftermarket. Uh, oh, you know what? They, they did a triple dot here. Oh, I can't even show you guys. Here you go. Uh, this triple dot, usually when it says BMO is before market open or AMC is after market close, they didn't have a specified time, so they could have reported early. Let's look at JWN. You'll be able to tell by a price chart. JWN, here is your Nordstrom's. We'll bust that down to a five-minute basis. And then, of course, the easy way to tell is bring out your 24-hour clock. And yes, they reported after earning after market today. And you can tell just by the way it moves. So thank you very much for that one, Okunola. Um, I, I was wrong. Actually, I wasn't wrong. It was just looking at the uh, the calendar I was using was wrong. Dana says, question, how does it work with the reports versus the Fed's pumping money into the market? Well, if you're talking about the economic data I was talking about, it's all one giant chess game that's manipulated by Feds and central banks and politicians. So, you know, how does it work? Um, I mean, that's a whole crazy show we could do just on how one, in, one thing impacts the other, but it's... It's not that it works a specific way. Um, I, I think there's a, a certain randomness to it. And if you get bad economic data, sometimes you see a knee-jerk reaction from the feds or the government saying, hey, we need to fix this, so let's do some kind of stimulus. So um, it's not uniform in the way that it works, I think. Uh, just bring your dog to the fight tomorrow. He's here somewhere. He's, he's laying around probably on his dog bed getting old. All right, guys, that'll do it for me. Uh, tomorrow will be Justin Krebs. We'll talk about annuities. If you guys have any questions, comments, uh, want to know more about Bill Addis, you can find him on his LinkedIn page. That's the easiest way to get to get in touch with Bill. He's not a big social media guy, but he mentioned he does LinkedIn, and I'll show you. There's his picture right there, Bill Addis. 
Uh, and he always has some really great articles. A lot of it is kind of eye-opener, and I've actually used some of that for show topics because it's just so good. Uh, he'll be doing a course called the Showcase, which will be uh, a two- or three-day class. I think it's a two-day class uh, talking about bonds and bond markets, but there'll be kind of a preview of that this Thursday. You can find out more information by going to tradinggetit.com. All right, uh, that will do it, guys. Again, I'm going to step away, or as I could just keep on talking and talking and talking. So thank you guys so much. If you like today's show, give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to it, as most of you are probably subscribed. I'll see you guys tomorrow with Justin Krebs talking annuities. He's going down.